Hi, my name is Brandon Bailey. I work within the cybersecurity subdivision at the Aerospace Corporation. And we're excited to be here today uh, in conjunction with the Space ISAC and the Airspace Village to be discussing the topic on some spacecraft research that we've been working on, specifically related to uh, exploitation of some of the implementations upon the spacecraft. So we'll jump right into it. I would uh, like to refer people to uh, the paper linked in the front for more information about how you can apply certain cybersecurity controls for a spacecraft. So uh, from an introduction perspective, when you look at uh, vulnerabilities in information systems, uh, particular satellites, uh, they're often overlooked in, in the wider discussions when you talk about critical infrastructure, but, but that's uh, changing quite rapidly currently where there's a lot more people discussing uh, spacecraft vulnerabilities, ground system vulnerabilities, and how it relates to our critical infrastructure as a country. So there's been a lot of misunderstanding and somewhat complacency in this regard because there's been a lack of uh, real live events uh, that's known in the public space of, of you know, attacks uh, against space vehicles. But the space systems are similar to other uh, systems. Uh, one that you would kind of know about is the industrial control systems or operational technology field. So you, you see some good parallels that can be drawn between the space craft and the space systems arena with, with that. So uh, malicious insiders, external threats, um, yeah, supply chain threats, those are all uh, various threat vectors that people can get in to affect spacecraft from the sensors to the data being uplinked or downlinked. Uh, so there's a lot of different different areas where you could have uh, impact that could disrupt you know, military, government, or even commercial activity um, for our day-to-day -day activities. So the, the threats are changing quite rapidly. In, in this arena. So there's a lot more knowledge about space and things of that nature. So, uh, and, they, and then when they would happen, there'd be an absence of warning. So, you know, there's not real time consistent communication between ground and space a lot of times. So there could be times where you're not aware that there, there's attacks ongoing and attribution is difficult in the IT world and it's even more difficult in the space world. And there definitely needs to be more research in this area, and that's one of the that's one of the reasons why we're uh, presenting this material is, and this is I'm assuming one of the reasons why the Aerospace Village exists is because there's a lot more collaboration and research that needs to happen in this arena, and the CubeSat arena is just exploding as we all know, and the barrier to entry into space is is being reduced quite extensively. So, the good thing is, is in recent years there's been some open source technology that's been put out there that can help people learn more about space, space communication, space protocols, things like that. So Cosmos, uh, which is linked here, NASA's core flight executive or core flight uh, software, OpenSat kit was put out by NASA to help people get, get started with CubeSats. NOS3 was put out by NASA's independent verification and validation program to help people build simulators for space. So there's a lot of good uh, open source material out there now so people can actually start researching this for themselves which is great um, but i will caveat that with one thing is please change your default configs if you're pulling the core flight executive or core flight software from from github and running it accordingly you want to make sure that you can change those default configs so um, let's move on to so some basics so for people who aren't necessarily uh, living and breathing, you know, space communications and, and commanding and telemetry and that terminology. Here's just an introduction slide to kind of explain what we're talking about. So command and data, data handling or referred to as CNDH is, is essentially how data is relayed to from the spacecraft. So that's where the encoding and decoding happens for the commands and the telemetry. Uh, there's kind of generically four pieces of a, of a space system. You have the user terminal where you do the, the commanding and the telemetry. Uh, and process telemetry that runs the ground software. There's some sort of front end processor that does the conversions of the information from the ground system to get it connected to a modem or an antenna that you can uh, send the information to the, to the spacecraft and get it back down. So from a cyber perspective, uh, the attack surface is quite large because there's a lot of standard IT equipment in there, um, you know, like with the ground terminals, the front end processors, there's a lot of uh, operational technology, industrial control systems that operate within these facilities that run these systems. So 
or control the antennas. And of course the RF link is, is, is obvious one. Um, so something to note on this diagram is the, the bulk encryption component is, is kind of left out for people that are more accustomed to uh, satellite communication where you have you know, cryptos on each end. So uh, I left that out just for, for ease, for you know, simplicity, but uh, sometimes it, you do have that bulk encryption there in the middle. Uh, and this is just a quick animation of kind of what this looks like where you, the user would say, turn this heater on and then the, the software translates that to some, you know, hex numbers and then it gets converted by the front end processor to, be, to get framed appropriately then sent to the modem to get modulated up to the bird and back down. So um, that's just a simple animation to kind of articulate what we're talking about here. And <clears throat> slide five here is something, a uh, paper that was put out by NASIC, the National Air and Space Intelligence Center, which is a pretty good resource if you're wanting to understand the, the high level architecture of space systems and where cyber threats could uh, have an impact oh, and the type of cyber threats there are. So in this diagram, it's uh, basically just outlining that you have you know, the user segment where you have the, you know, the, the, the ground software terminals and then the interacts with the ground segment where you have the antennas at times um, or in the, in the link segment with the RF and the space segment for space. So uh, vulnerabilities exist in all these segments and there's cyber threats within all these segments. Um, obviously, you know, the user segment is the highest likelihood for a cyber attack given that it may have some level of internet connection where it's operated by people and we understand as, as being a, you know, security researchers or pen testers or red teamers that the, the people are generally the weakest link in the, in the cyber paradigm. So um, the user segment is one of the easier areas to get in, but we're going to focus more on the space segment and the link segment specifically because that's where there's less research and less uh, publicized information. So we're going to focus on three types of attacks today with, with some demonstration uh, screenshots and to discuss, you know, how they work, what they are, and how you can mitigate these things. So we're going to talk about a replay attack, um, which is where you record the command signal and replay it to the vehicle and see if it processes it. So um, we'll do that. We'll talk about command link intrusion, where you basically simulate modulating your own signal to a, to a satellite and seeing if it processes those commands. And then we'll do a denial of service uh, where you could do some GPS jamming to maybe cause the denial of service condition on a, on a satellite, depending on the implementation for the satellite. So we'll jump in to the command replay first and, and discuss uh, that, that attack vector. So in the real world, which is not what we're operating with this demonstration, we're operating within simulation, but in the real world, you have you know, your ground terminals and an antenna that sends a RF signal to a satellite. So in the real world, if you were to do a command replay attack, you would need some sort of sniffing device to sniff the RF signal from the ground antenna while it's transmitting the uplink to the satellite. Well, in our simulated world, because uh, we're using some high fidelity simulation capabilities that have been built that we can use, simply UDP gets translated from the antenna to the satellite. So we're not you know, sending RF signals from a ground station to a simulated satellite. Although you could do that, but it, for our purposes, uh, we're going to use a simulator that just essentially takes the, the TCP IP traffic from the front end processor and then it uh, translates it to UDP and then sends it to a spacecraft simulator that's running. So if we're doing that with UDP, then we can obviously use something as simple as TCP dump um, for our research. So that's that's, that's kind of how we're set up. So this is the simulator that we're using and it's, it's got some real components to it. Um, that's, you know, runs in operations today for various uh, missions that are flying. So there's a ground software component. Uh, there's a front end processor. There's the ground station SIM that uh, is used to translate the information to UDP. And then that sends it to the spacecraft um, that has a dynamic simulator with it. So, we're using uh, real ground software in this simulation. We're using real front end processor software. None of these have been modified. They're using the same software baselines as operational uh, missions are using. It, it uses the same communication protocols, uh, CCSDS, uh, TC and AOS. So you can Google those if you want to learn more about it, but we'll get a little bit more into that detail later. 
but we aren't using any type of encryption. So there's no you know point to point encryption or bulk encryption anywhere in this. And we'll explain why, because that's the point of the, of the demonstration is to show when you don't have encryption, what can happen. Um, we have some real flight software that runs on several operational missions uh, currently, and it's, but it's cross compiled for, for Linux. So it's not uh, running on an embedded processor, a power PC or an arm or some, some FPGA. Um, it's running just in Linux for, for our purposes, because we're just focused on the software um, testing at this point and not being you know, too, too high fidelity. But there are technologies that exist where you can get super high fidelity. And we've used those in the past for several things like uh, things like uh, Simix or, or Kimu uh, or TCM. These are, these are different technologies that can you, you can use to have higher fidelity simulations to run software like compiled for target. So those can be integrated in these simulators as well. So the ground station sim is, is kind of what mimics the RF transmission for us. But for us, it just translates to UDP, as I said earlier. So uh, there's a simulation that's out there called 42 that's put out by NASA that helps uh, do the attitude, the orbit dynamics and environmental models. So that, that helps us uh, understand the orbit and, and how we're progressing there. So, uh, so here we go. So the, uh, and you can build your own uh, one of these with some sources from GitHub. So these are linked here, OpenSat Kit and NOS3 have some great uh, components that you can construct something similar for yourself. Okay, so for, for our specific demonstration for command replay, our satellite in this scenario orbits the Earth and is scheduled to uplink downlink when it's over top of three different ground sites, one in California, one in Spain, one in Australia. So one would be uh, Australia's in Canberra, Spain, Madrid, California, um, out near LA. So uh, the point of our demonstration is we're going to capture the UDP traffic with TCP dump as it's leaving the ground station during the uplink pass. So this uh, mimics an R RF sniffing capture. And then we're going to replay that with TCP replay. So um, we did a quick, you know, uh, Google search on the internet looking for uh, what type of hardware and technologies needed to reproduce this, reproduce this type of an attack in real life. And basically is around $7,000. You could get some equipment that could record capture and, and transmit signal to a low earth orbit. So it's definitely achievable for, you know, people who have a little bit of money, but then, with the advent of some of these new technologies that are coming out today, like AWS Ground Station, the barrier could be much lower. So you may not need so much equipment. You may need sniffing capabilities, but we're a little unsure on what practices are going to be in place for AWS in, in the future. So to prevent you know these type of things from happening. But you know, uh, with that being said, it's just it's just art trying to articulate that the barrier for doing you know uh, communications to a vehicle. Uh, is getting less and less. Okay, so setting up the, the, the attack. So uh, in our simulation, the satellite is visible to the ground station over the Madrid uh, ground station. So it's there and then in the bottom middle here, you see a signal lock uh, in, in that window. It says, okay, it's locked, it's acquired. So it's sending the connect message and then it's uplinking the command. So you see uh, several commands being transmitted you know, that's a bunch of numbers there. But what that does is you look in the far right, you see <clears throat> the flight software that's running. That's the, you know, that's kind of like the UART window of a flight software where you have the, the flight software is responding. You see it processes these no-op commands. So in this example, we just hit some simple no-op commands, uh, which is kind of like a, a ping, you know, in, in, in our terminology. So just to see if the, the application running on board is alive. So Upon receiving that command, the flight software indeed does process that command and downlinks the event messages and the command counters increment. So you see here uh, in the ground, you see that the, the event messages are processed. It says, hey, there's, there was a no op command and it's downlinked to the ground. And then you see the command counters increment accordingly. So you see that the CMD PC, which is you know, short for command process, uh, for each of those applications that were, were sent commands processed the increment to one, it was zero, so it goes to one. Now. Now the satellite in our scenario is in transit between Madrid and Canberra. And you see in the ground station simulation that the, it's lost signal, so it's no longer in view. So now here's where we could actually do our replay attack. So in a real world scenario, you would need equipment, obviously in the Madrid area to capture the, the RF traffic and then somewhere over India, 
uh, in this example, you would need transmit capability to be able to send transmit the information uh, to the satellite. So in our scenario, it's a lot easier, obviously, because we're using uh, just you new know, TCP replay. And here's just a simple command. It, it replays the PCAP file that was captured. And then you see the flight software respond accordingly with the same you know, event, event messages within the UART. But uh, what you don't see is uh, any event messages on the ground station because you were in between passes at that point. And the command counters, you notice when you establish the downlink again over Canberra that the command counters went up. So the, software, the flight software is reporting, hey, I received another command and, you know, in between ground passes, which would be odd. So from a, you know, defensive cyber operations perspective on the ground or, you know, uh, C and D perspective, if you're not op monitoring certain key telemetry points on your vehicle, you may not be aware that you know, someone has tried to make a connection or, or uh, send commands. So it's, it's very important to understand what the telemetry values are that you could be monitoring that could uh, provide you insight into potential attack vectors. So there's a lot of different telemetry points out there that could help, help with that. So <clears throat> that, that wraps up the command replay. So essentially what we did was uh, capture the command link up and then we replayed it and we saw that it processed it. So um, we'll move on to command link intrusion, which is a little bit different. It's a slight different take on, 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 on a command, uh, uh, command link attack. So <clears throat> since there's no encryption in our, in our environment or simulated environment here, uh, and there's no authentication, theoretically, we were, the thought was, well, if you just inspect the, the traffic and understand the, the packet structure and understand what information is in there, theoretically, you could craft your own packet that matches that structure and just send it up and see if it processes the command. So you're not really replaying anything. You're just constructing your own uh, raw uh, command packet and then uplinking it and seeing what happens. So let's try that out and see how it works. So once you've uh, inspected the traffic and understand there's no encryption, you see in one of the telemetry values, and you, just, you could do, obviously do this with RF as well. You could you know, record the RF on the downlink and record it as well. But you see, once you have the information and you see here in the middle, you see CFE, TBL, no op, CFE version 6.6.0.0. So you see that information there. And um, that implies that they're using core flight executive or core flight software. And so then you can say, well, that's available on GitHub, I believe. So this is where the, that you know, comment about default configs uh, really comes into play. So you go look on GitHub and you understand uh, that CFE, CFS uses the CCSDS protocol. So then you get into this uh, research study on, on command packet structures, which is, uh, which is a fun study. Uh, would not recommend it for, for the for people if they're not really interested in it because it's a little bit of a, a read. But so we're looking, you know, we start to uh, break down how these systems work from a protocol perspective. So we have space packets and then, we, you know, we're going to get into some really um, space buzzword bingo here. Uh, so I apologize for that. But uh, for the people who you know know what this is, um, you'll get it. But um, for the people who don't know, uh, forgive me for kind of speaking in this lingo, but the space packets get wrapped in these transfer frames and then the transfer frames are wrapped in what's called these command link transmission units, CLTUs. So that's kind of how this structure works is CLTU transfer frame headers, space packet, uh, and then the, the trailers. So, so then we start looking in the CCSDS protocol uh, and we understand, okay, this is the space packet. These are the octets that are there. Uh, and then we start really diving into some of these documents and we say, okay, well, this is what the primary header is. This is what a transfer frame looks like. This is what the transfer frame primary header looks like. This is what the CLTU looks like. And then, so we're kind of in this overload of terminology, protocol breakdown, uh, things like that. So it gets a little cumbersome and confusing, but it's important to understand uh, all these things. And it's also important to realize that these, these protocols are open source protocols. So a lot of, the, a lot of missions, uh, spacecraft that are out there today uh, leverage CCSDS because that is an international standard uh, that um, the CCSDS group is a, is a consortium of many space agencies from across the world who get together and standardize on 
protocols and uh, things like that. So uh, it's easy, you just kind of, go, you can just Google the standards and find them and then they'll have these diagrams in there and you can break down, you know, the bit patterns and things. So from our transmission, since there's no encryption on that, you just basically have the raw uh, number structure. And <laughs> to the, to the kind of uninformed, this looks just like a bunch of, of gibberish, but what we're gonna do is take the knowledge we gain from reading the hundreds and hundreds of pages of those CCSDS uh, protocols and see what we can find out. So let's look here, we see uh, the, the, the fives uh, in our scenario is the acquisition sequence. And then we've determined where the CLTU is so we've now we've got the CLTU, so let's break that down and see what we can get. So then we take off the headers and trailers in this example. And then now we have uh, a, a, this subset and then we have this um, code blocks and these check bytes and we take those out. So now we've identified the actual TC transfer frame, which is, which is where the, the command information is stored on the, on the uplink. So now we've got that. So let's take out the, the header on that and now we have the command packet. So this is the one that we were looking for. So out of all those numbers, um, this is really what we were looking for. We we're looking for this command packet because it's gonna tell us hopefully what kind of command was sent up on that uplink. So from the, from the telemetry stream, we've kind of discussed, we see this no op command that, that came down. So uh, we've, we look on the GitHub repo and we've realized that in our example, that the spacecraft uh, that we're looking at seems to be using these default command and telemetry IDs. So, because if you look at the, the header file for the message IDs uh, for the CFE table command message ID, you see 1804. So that would indicate like the high likelihood of actually the uh, software is using these default message ID types. So what that does is allow you to basically transmit information to the, you're going to try to transmit information using this knowledge you've gained to the to the simulated spacecraft to see kind of what will happen. So let's see if we can uh, we can uh, reconstruct a packet with this knowledge and see what we can do with it. So with this knowledge, let's play around a little bit and see what we can do. So we've got our knowledge of the command structure from GitHub, and let's see if we can't construct a new command, maybe something else to see what happens, just to see if the command uh, the spacecraft will actually process it. So you have to do a little digging and understand. The functionality of this of the software but luckily all that information is open source so once you dig in a little bit you see you notice there's this functionality within the um, core flight software uh, called es it's an es application where you can potentially you know uh, have control over the applications on board so we're, we're going to see if we can't reconstruct the packet to do a reboot of a particular application so uh, in the real world you know you would have to reverse engineer the packet structure of the RF signal. But in our scenario, we're going to transmit the UDP packet uh, with, with following information and see if we can get a reset of one of the applications. So uh, we use that 1806 because that's the default uh, message ID or uh, for the ES application. So that tells the flight software, hey, uh, this command is meant for the ES application to process once it gets on the satellite. And then the rest of the numbers uh, is just you know, understanding the, uh, translating the command and telemetry database into this format, which I won't bore you with all the details that had to happen for that to occur, but um, you can get there, essentially. It just takes a while to figure out what, what the structure is and what numbers need to go where and what those values need to be. So let's send this raw packet up, see what we can do. So we send that raw packet up to the, up to the satellite and look, look at that. So we see in the UART of the, of the actual uh, flight software that we have some sort of response. So you see at the top of the window, you see CFE ES restart app initiated for HK. So it looks like it was successful. So we essentially have reconstructed our own packet based on information that we've gained, uh, gained from you know, GitHub and then transmitted it to our uh, spacecraft simulator and it indeed did process it. So that's that's an example of, you know, a command link intrusion where you've basically built your own command structure and sent it up and got it to process. So that's, that's kind of the response. So the question is like, okay, why do, why does the replay attack work? Why does this uh, command link intrusion attack work? So 
part of it's the open sourceness of the information's out there. So you can pull that data from GitHub and do your own research, but it really uh, gets down to the protocols and some of the protections. So in this example, uh, there's a communications operational procedure that's typically runs on a satellite, uh, at least ones that operate CCSDS called COP1. And um, that helps with sequencing uh, to make sure that the sequence of the commands and the packets received are, are proper. On our example, COP1 wasn't turned on by, by basic, you know, by design in our example, but there's a lot of actual spacecraft who don't leverage COP1 for various reasons. So COP1 would have provided some level of protection, but that can be fudged and, and gotten around if you know what you're doing. But so an example, I redid the same example for replay with COP1 enabled, and you see here that the commands not processed because they were out of sequence. So I could have really fudged, fudged the, the data around with sequencing and probably got out the process, but we, we didn't really want to get into that. But the, the point was just to articulate that there are sequencing protections that you could put in to help with uh, the replay. But the, the, the real you know, control that you want is, is encryption and authentication. So you really need to encrypt and authenticate the, the command link. So it's not, it's not enough to just do encryption because you theoretically could just <clears throat> replay an encrypted link uh, and it would process accordingly. So you need the authentication on the command link as well. So that's important. So you, got, you need both. So to properly protect from a replay or an intrusion attack, like here are some just guidelines, you know, um, for, for, you know, pseudo requirements, sample requirements about cryptography and authentication. So you need to authenticate and you need to do cryptography to ensure that these attacks won't work. Okay, so now we're gonna jump into um, denial of service via GPS jamming. So we've, we, the first two were particularly to the command link. So those were, you know, uh, uh, intrusion and replay. This one's a little bit different and it's gonna use a different simulator, but uh, we won't get into the specifics on the sim, but it's a high fidelity simulator that has a lot of dynamics and a lot of uh, command and uh, data handling and GNC capabilities. So what we're gonna do is get, get, the, get the vehicle in an operational state where it's doing emission operations. Uh, and then we're going to denial service the, simulate the denial service with the GPS signal, which is basically cut off the GPS. And then we're gonna see how the system responds. So uh, jamming, uh, for those who aren't necessarily aware, is you know, the intentional or sometimes unintentional interference of the signal that prevents it from being received. So it's, it's, it's relatively simple to do. Um, it's easy to overpower at close range and jammers can be in, on the ground, it can be in the ocean, airspace, jammers can be about anywhere. So in our scenario, the spacecraft simulator is set up to be in what's called mission science mode or operational mode. And once it reaches this mode, we're gonna you know, simulate the GPS signal by stopping the flow uh, on the space wire uh, bus, which is where the data, where the GPS gets, sends its data uh, to the single board computer, the flight software. So here is just uh, a graphical representation of some of the telemetry and, and dynamics data for this particular sim as it's operating. And we are, you know, it shows, uh, you see the uh, attitude control mode previous to attitude control mode current, which is MSM, which is the mission science, which is the operations mode. So what we're gonna do here is uh, we're gonna block that data from getting to the single board computer, the flight software from the GPS sensors. And we're gonna see what happens. So in the middle here, you see <clears throat> the GS data, GPS data packet counts increasing. So you see it go from 920 to 944. So everything's optimal here. We're operating, we're flying in orbit. GPS signal is uh, being processed and everything is, is fine. So here, now we're going to, in our simulation, we're gonna basically uh, leverage a capability that was built in the simulator to uh, block data across the space wire bus uh, based on whichever uh, values we want. So we, we can block about anything that's flowing across the space wire bus or 1553 bus for that matter um, and see, see what happens. So, once you initiate this block sequence, you see the ground telemetry values freeze. So you see, which indicates the gray background there. So at this, the, the ground station is reporting, hey, I, I don't, I'm not receiving GPS data anymore. For some reason, it's not being downlinked. Uh, and that's because it's not being actually provided to the single board computer for downlink. So, so you see that freeze. 
So, uh, and you know, for spacecraft, you know, one thing to understand is, is, uh, you know, uh, you can't, you can't uh, go up there. You can't like a, obviously a real computer go, you know, hit the reset button. Uh, there's a lot of autonomy built in. There's a lot of fault management and a lot of testing goes around fault management response. So what you should know is like typically when you have a, uh, a satellite in orbit and some anomalous thing happens, uh, it, uh, the, the last ditch effort to save it basically is to go into what's called a sun point or a safe mode. So it, it basically takes the solar arrays and points it to the to the sun and says, I'm just going to hang out here until I hear from from the people who are controlling me in the ground station. Um, so what we're going to do here is see what the autonomous flight response is once the GPS signal is blocked. So safe mode is, is an operational mode uh, where a lot of non-essential systems are shut down. Uh, it's very similar to, to, to Windows, you know, when you, when Windows uh, goes into safe mode, it shuts off a lot of the features of Windows uh, from that perspective. So uh, preservation of the spacecraft is the highest priority. So here uh, you see in the downlink telemetry, the, the flight software is starting to uh, do its autonomous fault management. It's you know, running what are called uh, RTSs, so uh, relative time sequences. So these are things, these are just automated flight responses that are there and it's you know, starting to do uh, various things. It's you know, doing movements. It's stopping antennas. It's transitioning to some point mode from an attitude control perspective. So it's starting to safe itself. And in the telemetry you see from the attitude control mode perspective, it's reached its desired some point state at this point. So, so why would you perform a denial of service, you know, like GPS jamming on, on something? So you know, maybe you're just wanting uh, to have a little fun. Maybe you're just trying to disrupt or degrade some sort of mission operations for a specific time. Maybe you're wanting a mission to not achieve an objectives, but what if you're a little bit smarter than that and you understand the autonomous fault response for satellites and you understand the design and, and fault management a little bit more. So uh, a more strategic, you know, uh, attacker understands that there's a lot of autonomous fault response for a mission to put itself in a really safe state so if you just think about the safe mode for Windows, you know, a lot of the security features get disabled uh, while you're in safe mode. And it does, similar things do happen for spacecraft. So uh, forcing a spacecraft into safe mode could potentially open up additional vectors that aren't there. So uh, think about a, uh, you know, maybe if you've jammed the GPS signal, maybe your fault management responses to safe yourself, turn off crypt cryptography, you know, and open up and your command link for any signal that you can process. So it just depends on the fault management response. Uh, it's a, that's a design decision, but just think about that as you're doing your design that you may not uh, think through. It's like, Hey, maybe adversaries may know that I can be more vulnerable, uh, get put in a more vulnerable state. So maybe I need to design in something, you know, the terminology that we put in the, that paper that was linked in the front, the defense and uh, defending the spacecraft in the cyber domain paper, we talk about the cyber safe mode. So that's, you know, that's a, you know, slight transition from the traditional safe mode terminology, but it's basically, uh, it's a safe mode that's cyber hardened to a degree. And it, it, you have a high integrity uh, mode that you're in that you know you're in a good state and everything's valid and you still have authentication and encryption going on. So, so that, you know, that's a concept, that's a kind of a newer concept that's being discussed in the space in the space sectors but it should be it should be there uh because knowing you know more and more uh people that understand space and understand fault management response may use that against you so you may want to think about that a little bit more as you do your design so uh here's some recommendations for just generalized protection this isn't specific to gps jamming because there's a whole there's papers upon papers out there that talk about how to protect against jamming but this is more in line with uh, protecting against, you know, uh, leveraging fault management against you. So you need to really need to protect that documentation because that's just basically providing an adversary, a pathway to get you in a, a more vulnerable state if your design is built that way. And uh, you know, other design considerations about always encrypting information, especially on the downlink. So some people think that the, the downlink on the telemetry side should not necessarily be encrypted because it's not, it's, you know, it's not controlling the vehicle, but there could be a lot of good information that is uh, ascertained from telemetry. So it could be, you could have adversaries monitoring your telemetry stream, looking for various uh, 
you know, indicators that you are in a less secure state. Um, and, the, and these are other some design considerations that are, that are here. I'll, I won't read them all to you, but basically getting, you know, the cyber safe mode, getting, you know, only report error messages when needed uh, and encrypting it accordingly and getting, make sure you have the ability to recover and reconstitute to a known state. So these are just some considerations to, to, to think about as you're you know, building your design for, for a spacecraft. So uh, with that being said, that, those are just an example of, of doing you know, some protection. So let's talk about what it takes to, uh, let's transition the discussion a little bit and talk about what it takes to just protect the overall ground system. So we've, at this point, we've talked <clears throat> about you know, the, the uh, command link intrusion, we've talked about uh, command replay, some denial service, uh, but let's talk more generically about space systems in general. So uh, I, I like to use defense in depth uh, as, as a presentation material and discuss and a, and a principle for design as, as many people do. I mean, I think anyone in the security community really understands the fifth in depth, but um, with the fifth in depth, I like to illustrate basically using an onion. So in the typical, you know, IT sense, uh, you know, the onion diagram, you have, you know, the hardened server configuration wrapped uh, with intrusion prevention firewall type stuff. But in the space domain, it's a little bit different, but it's somewhat similar. But so here's some graphics that I wanted to provide that give you a uh, representation of the fits and depth for both ground and space. So uh, this first graphic here is kind of the ground system. So it starts with the data that runs, you know, on the endpoints uh, wrapped by software, supported by uh, endpoints connected by networks, protected by intrusion detection and perimeter controls and physical controls. So there's a, you know, uh, this isn't all inclusive, not every subcategory, you know, within each block is listed uh, due to space, but uh, it provides a good list of things that you would expect to be at each layer of the onion. So from a data perspective, you may have, you know, data at rest encryption, you may have Tempest that you need to worry about. From a ground software perspective, you know, SDLC, secure coding, common weakness enumeration prevention, things like that, binary analysis, dynamic analysis, static code analysis, stuff like that. Your endpoints, you know, your, your HIDs, your HIPs, your AV, malware, DLP, file integrity, things like that. So we won't dive into every one of these, but it's kind of important to understand that you, you can pick and choose to apply controls at each layer. And it's important to apply controls to each layer. So you don't want to just put all your eggs in the perimeter basket and say, I'm going to stand up a good DLP, a good firewall uh, and uh, security zones on the perimeter. And then hope that gets me there because you, know, you have insiders, you have other avenues where you need monitoring capability, you need protections. So that's pretty common. You know, that's nothing groundbreaking from a ground perspective, but similarly, you can do the, the, the kind of the exact same approach for the vehicle itself. So, this is a onion representation for the vehicle. So you have, you know, the, the similarly the data that's on board the vehicle uh, wrapped and processed by some sort of software on board that has a single board computer or, a, you know, uh, a processor and a bus, uh, hopefully protected by some sort of on, onboard intrusion detection prevention. So that's kind of a new area. What's being researched today is, is kind of onboard cyber monitoring and intrusion detection prevention. That's, that's not typical on a lot of missions right now. Uh, what you see currently, a lot of the focus on protecting uh, space vehicles is really geared around the crypto comms area. So, um, you know, the, the, the authentication encryption and the, and the um, comms link, the, trans, the transect, things like that. So, uh, but there are controls that you can apply and there are threat vectors that, that exist for basically every, um, every one of these blocks on the vehicle as well as on the ground. So, since there's you know threats and vulnerabilities that can be exploit uh, can happen on kind of each block, it's important to put controls at each block, honestly, so that you can have a better chance of, of protecting your protecting yourself. So, in con you know in conclusion, we you know we've talked you know, kind of three attack vectors, but those those are just uh, three examples of, and there's many more that can be discussed. But uh, it's it's kind of convenient you know to ignore security. Uh, honestly, because there's not been this, you know, windfall of um, events that have happened that are cyber related uh, on a vehicle, but it's, it's, it's not really an option moving forward. Uh, it's, satellites are too critical 
to our everyday life or operations of our nation and, and the world, honestly. And it's kind of important to understand that these, the barrier to entry into space has been dramatically reduced in the last you know, five, 10, 15 years. I mean, with small sats and launch services and AWS ground stations, it's getting real easy to, to get a lot cheaper uh, to get information. Uh, it's a lot cheaper to get uh, assets in the space. So, uh, and the fence and depth needs to be a big part of the solution. So we need to design security at the beginning, which is kind of cliche, but obvious. Uh, and it's gonna be more and more important as we you know, start to deploy all these small sats in a peripher peripheral constellation moving forward. So, you know, from a defense and depth perspective and, and you know, uh, understanding security, it's, it's important. So, I mean, there's a little bit of a, a interesting parallel you can draw, you know, with space systems and in the industrial control system arena. So it's, it's um, you know, for years and years, you, you see this at, you know, at the uh, IoT village as well. For years and years, people have kind of ignored security in that industrial control systems, OT, IoT arena. Uh, and it's not just been the last few years, people have really started understanding that threat vector. Uh, and, and mainly it's due to, there's been documented attacks and a lot of bad things have happened for, as a result of that. So let's try to learn from that lesson and not wait till something really bad happens to make corrections. Because we know there are vulnerabilities, we know there are corrections, we know there are things we can do. So we should, we should be doing that. Uh, and the small sat marketplace, you know, and the embedded security community is evolving. There's a lot of commercial things that are being put out. There's some open source solutions that are out there. And um, we need, you know, accountability. We need people who are researching this, this to understand the security ramifications of these things and, and need to be, be somewhat agile to get these things verified and validated and accepted and put out in the community um, as opposed to some niche areas. Niche, you know, niche markets, people doing things. So it's, it's, it's important for us to uh, get, you know, leverage the, the explosion of this market, but it's also, uh, we need the security researchers and, and uh, you know, ethical uh, hackers and things like that to really, you know, hold people accountable for the things they're putting out. Uh, Cause you know, the path of least, least resistance is often used. So if no one's looking at your, looking at your work and understanding the security ramifications of your design and what you're doing, uh, it, you know, people kind of get lazy with their implementation at times. So it's important that we all get out there and research this stuff and look, look into it to understand the ramifications, some of these design choices that are being made. Uh, so we need to really, you know, the government industry, uh, I think we're coming to a very good, you know, agreement that cybersecurity is super important for, for space programs. And there's a lot of investment that needs in education, training, and talent development and retention. So I, uh, I feel like there's a huge step forward this year <clears throat> at DEF CON with the Hackasat. I mean, that, that is a fantastic event that, you know, that's ongoing within the Aerospace Village to, to you know, hack into to representative satellite systems. Uh, and it, you know, there's these open source technologies that are put out that you can build your own ground and space simulation. You can start learning. You know, five years ago, there's not that much out there to, to learn. So the, the activation energy and the level of uh, access to information was, wasn't there for the security community to, to get into it. So I think it behooves us, you know, within the government, uh, within the, the industry to start getting this information out there and making this stuff available for the researchers so they can, you know, we can find some of these vulnerabilities and get them fixed. Uh, and technology has evolved from a simulation perspective so much in the last 10 years uh, with the advent of you know, digital twin type technology for space, the embedded arena is, is getting there you know, with open source, things like Kimu, with commercial things like Simix uh, or TCM. You can get really high fidelity simulators running software and uh, that's you know, built for target and running a lot of tests. You don't have to buy these million dollar space platforms uh, and they're in, in also these, you know, these cube sets that you can buy and these embedded processors, you can buy some of these uh, things kind of commercially off the shelf, start doing your own research if you have some of the budget. Um, but one, uh, the last point is, you know, the reason I wanted to do this presentation and, and be a part of the Aerospace Village and, and, and work with the Space ISAC is, is information sharing is a must. I mean, 
coming from the government arena, you really get into this compartmentalization of information and you, the need to know uh, and, and things like that. So, but we really need to have information sharing. We need to do research. We need to have events like this, the Aerospace Village. We need to uh, you know, come together as a community and start doing this research together. And we're not trying to point fingers at people and you know say that, oh, your implementation is bad. It's just, we need to learn together and make things make things better and, and share what we learn and do presentations like this. So with that being said, uh, that's about all I have to present, but I do have uh, here on slide 29, a link to some resources, <clears throat> the Space ISAC uh, there uh, for information on it, the, the Hackasat link. Uh, something that, that's gonna be really cool is their, they, the Hackasat was, you know, they had qualification rounds and then they have the finals at DEF CON this year. And they're going to open source uh, a lot of those CTFs and qualifications and, and things. So keep keep an eye on the Hackensat uh, URL to you know maybe pull down some of those CTFs once they get published and and give them a, give them a try yourself and learn. This is a really exciting uh, exercises that were put together. If you want to build some of your own simulators, you know, these links are are there with for OpenSat Kit, uh, NOS Cube, Forty Two, things like that. Open source flight software, CFP, CFS. Uh, and there's some info here on uh, you know, jamming, if you want to learn a bit more about that. And the paper that, <clears throat> that was published in November 2019 is also linked here for your reference. So with that being said, that is all I have to present. And uh, thank you so much. And I'll take questions in the offline session. Appreciate it.